Hi, everybody. It's Dr. Eric Corum, founder of AIM7. Welcome back to The Blueprint, where we distill cutting-edge science, leadership, and life skills into simple tactics optimized for your busy lifestyle and goals. Today, we're diving into the complex world of social media and its effects on our health. And to discuss this topic, we have Dr. Tommy Wood back on the show. Now, Dr. Wood is a neuroscientist and a self-proclaimed elite-level professional nerd. He's a performance consultant to world-class athletes in dozens of sports. Dr. Wood also received an undergraduate degree in biochemistry from the University of Cambridge, a medical degree from the University of Oxford, and a PhD in physiology and neuroscience from the University of Oslo. So this guy is not dumb. But the cool thing about him is he's super relatable. And that's what I love about Dr. Wood. And that's why I wanted to come on the show today, talk about something that impacts all of our lives. We'll explore how social media is impacting our mental health, especially with younger generations. I'm a father of three boys. And so this topic was very important for me to discuss with him. And we're going to discuss the surprising ways it impacts our physiology. Dr. Woods is also going to share practical strategies for healthier engagement with these platforms. So let's get right to it. Let's lean in and learn from the best. There's a lot in the media on social media, but the negative effects of social media. I have children. I'm concerned a little bit about my draw to want to get on social media and engage. I'm trying to be even more aware. I mean, my business, a lot of my business is run on social media. It's something I can't ignore, but I'm concerned about the downstream effects. So what are your thoughts on social media, the negative consequences of it, and what we can do about it? This is a hot topic right now. And the person who's brought it to the forefront is Jonathan Haidt. He just released his book, The Anxious Generation, which really focuses on the social media generation and how that's affecting adolescents and their mental health in particular. And the effect seems to be slightly bigger in girls than it is in boys, though universally seems to be having an effect. And I will say that there are lots of academics who disagree with him, who think there are other factors at play. So say issues around socioeconomic factors and those kinds of things may be driving some of this. That's what has been proposed by others. And I'm sure that plays a role. But if you really look at the full body of data and how it's presented by him and his colleagues, I I do think that it seems quite compelling that there's really been this effect in particularly in kids and adolescents who grew up with social media, you know, this previous resilience and mental health that we saw in kids 10 or 20 years ago has now basically has been completely lost. There used to be this um, like U-shaped curve of happiness with age. And like kids were happy. And then adults in their sort of 30s to 50s were kind of like the most cantankerous. And then older people got happy again. But now that's kind of been lost. And sort of like adolescents are less happy than they have been or they were two or three decades ago. And this seems to be part of that. The bit of it that I find most interesting is probably most related to my own sort of expertise and areas that I've worked in is how social media affects, again, how we think about ourselves and how that affects our physiology. So this is kind of related to actually, I think, very similarly related to the optimization story or what we're telling ourselves when we're trying to optimize. Because, or to give another step back, recently, last year, I uh, edited a special edition of a journal that I'm the editor of Lifestyle Medicine, which is published by Wiley. And we did a special issue on the effect of community and social connection on health. And one of the papers within that collection was written by George Slavich and colleagues at UCLA who have really dug into the physiological effects of social isolation and social stress. Like how does that affect first our psychology, then through that affects our physiology, and then our long-term health. And What you see is that when we are socially stressed or socially isolated, you activate this evolutionarily conserved shift in the autonomic and immune systems. And then that can affect our health long term. So there's kind of a sort of a parable that comes along with this. So imagine that we're living in our ancestral tribes, however long ago, a few thousand years ago. And when you're living in a small group like that, you need your immune system to function in a certain way. You need to be particularly good at dealing with communicable diseases and respiratory viruses. So when you're socially connected and in a close social group, your immune system sets itself up in one particular way. And that's particularly because colds and flus and things like that, 
that's what you're most likely to be exposed to. That's what your immune system is adapted to deal with. When you're socially isolated, so imagine you, you know, you're separated from your tribe and you're off yourself out on the savannah or in the jungle or, or on the Arctic tundra. That's where my mm -hmm. most recent ancestors were, right? Then your immune system shifts to be less good at dealing with respiratory viruses because you're not going to be exposed to any because you're alone, but to be better at dealing with things like wound healing, right? So it's a shift in the innate and the adaptive immune systems. And this is true. In that setting, when you're socially isolated, you do become better. You have faster wound healing, but you're less good at dealing with respiratory viruses. That comes along with a slight change in the balance of the autonomic nervous system. So you're more likely to drive, you know, like have higher sympathetic drive and then a greater overall chronic burden of inflammation because when you then get injured, you heal faster. But when you activate that program long term, as we see in individuals who are chronically socially isolated, that seems to be associated with an increased risk then of cardiovascular disease, dementia, depression, because you have this increase in chronic inflammation, as well as an increased sympathetic activation. And we know that those can then be drivers of long term diseases. So when you then think about social media, what you're doing is you are constantly thinking about your social rank. And social stress, like being demoted socially within a group, has that same effect on your physiology as being socially isolated. So, mm. you know, when you're a teenager and like your friends don't want to talk to you anymore and they start to make fun of you, like you're demoted in your social rank. And this is essentially what's happening to ourselves when we're on social media all the time. Because again, we're constantly comparing ourselves to others and we're demoting ourselves in our head socially. Here are all these people who are better looking and richer and happier than me. And then that you demote yourself internally, that then affects your physiology and that can affect your long-term mental and physical health. Are we seeing any data support compromise in our immune function because of social media? That's a really good question that I'm not sure has been addressed. Most people have really been focused on mental health, right. which is certainly related. You know, Some proportion of particularly depression and anxiety seem to have an immune component. Some people say it's maybe about a third. So that is maybe playing a role. Others have kind of hypothesized that in the process of lockdowns for COVID, we isolated people, which paradoxically may have made them less good at dealing with respiratory viruses when they then went back out into society. I don't think that's been proven, but kind of based on mechanisms that have been understood elsewhere, it's certainly an interesting hypothesis. But whether social media use then you know, affects immune, our immune systems and immune function, I'm not sure if anybody's looked at that. But if the hypothesis holds, you would expect to see that. Uh, but it'd be a nice question to test. There's crossover effects, though. You know, if you're depressed or anxious, you're going to have a compromised immune system if it's chronic. Oh, yeah. None of this happens in isolation, absolutely. And, and most things have a bi-directional effect, right? Because we know that some people, when they start to struggle with their mental health, they may be more likely to turn to social media. So mental health issues may increase social media use rather than the other way around. And certainly that it goes in both directions. How are you safeguarding yourself? So one thing that I've done is essentially just limit my use. And there are apps that can help you do that if you're unable to do that yourself. And then once you start to do that, and you know, maybe it takes sort of four to six weeks to really get into that, then you start to automatically use it less. So I've certainly found that to be helpful. Another thing is particularly when you're trying to get quote unquote deep work as Cal Newport calls it done, separating yourself from your phone, right? Not even having your phone in the room. There's nice work done by Gloria Mark and others showing that even just you get used to a pattern of distraction and then you start to distract yourself even if you're not getting that distraction coming in. So if you're used to picking up the phone to look at Instagram, you will start to do it automatically even if you're not getting notifications or anything like that. You interrupt yourself because you get used to that pattern of interruption. So separating yourself physically from those interruptions again over time can help to reduce that from happening. And then the final thing I think is knowing what you're using social media for, right? When Facebook first existed, it was used to like rank girls at Harvard or something stupid like that. Yeah. But then like the next iteration was used to generally connect you to your friends and family, right? And look at their photos and update them on your life in a faster manner. And I think that's kind of like a, a nice part of social media, as is maybe being connected to people with similar interests or, you know, creating a virtual support group that you couldn't get 
in your local community. Like, so like particularly if you're trying to change your diet or your exercise or your habits or, or something like that, you can find people who are trying to do the same thing and you can support one another. And that's another potential benefit. So really start to pare down who you follow and what you use social media for, or just being very, you know, know what you use it for and then craft it appropriately. Again, I, I think that that can help. So just being a little bit more considered in terms of what it is you're actually trying to get out of the platform and using it for that, as well as maybe decreasing total use if you can. If you've enjoyed the past two episodes of Dr. Wood, we've got one more coming up on how to better take care of our brains and the impact of sugar on our brains, alcohol and exercise. It's an awesome episode, so don't miss it. It's coming soon. Until next time, stay curious, stay consistent, and keep chasing excellence.